Okay, thanks. Um, is it here? Uh, thanks, Suzanne, and thanks, Ayat, and everybody at Podium for bringing me back to Oslo. I was here about a year ago, and I was very disappointed because there was ice and snow everywhere, and I couldn't walk because I'm not really very familiar. So it's nice to be able to walk and see the city is a very pretty, <laughs> without fear of death, <laughs> sleeping and dying. It's a very pretty city, and I hope to come back again. Um, so. What I have here for today is kind of um, a different version of what um, folks read for yesterday's seminar, which is my piece, Fractal Thinking. Um, so I have this different version in which I try to show how it works or doesn't work. That's part of the experiment. And if you are willing, and uh, if I read this uh, quick enough, I also have the film I did in collaboration with Arjuna Newman. Uh, actually, he did it in collaboration with me because he was the real filmmaker in the exercise. Uh, it's a 30-minute film which was commissioned by Stefano Harney for uh, the Bergen Assembly last year. So I don't know if some of you have seen it. Um, we can decide whether or not. I think it's a nice segue to, to the words. Um, I have three quotes. Oh, that's the film to get us started, and that's basically um, most of the images I have for, for the talk. Um, we might well ask if this phenomenon of marking and branding actually transfers from one generation to another, finding its various symbolic institution, substitutions in an efficacy of meanings that repeat the initiating, oh, that was a question, moment. <laughs> uh, the second quote, I have not come here to be insulted by a set of wretches of which every brick in your infernal town is cemented with an African's blood. That's a quote from Frederick Cook, who was a kind of a commentator in Liverpool in the late 1700s, 1800s. My other quote, which is going to hopefully stay with, with you for most of what I'm trying to do, is from Walter Benjamin. It's not that what's past casts light on what is present, or what's present, it's light on what's past. The other image is that wherein what has been comes together in a flash with an out to form a constellation. In other words, images, dialectics at standstill. For while the relation of the present to the past is purely temporal, a purely temporal continuous one, the relation of what has been to the now is dialectical. It's not progression, but image, suddenly emergent. Only dialectical images are genuine images that is not archaic. And the place where one encounters them, them is language. Four ships left the port of Liverpool that summer in 1769. Among them was the Unity, one of the hundred or so slave ships responsible for the one point million people Liverpool merchants transported during Britain's legal slave trade. Nearly a year later, while the Unity navigated the bottom line of the triangular trade in June 1770, the ship's log registered several attempted insurrections by the 435 captives on board. Just over 200 years later, in July 1981, toxic black residents revolted against Liverpool police arrest of a young black man, and the neighborhood would burn again in 2011 after London police killed an unarmed black man, Mark Dugan, in Tottenham, North London. In this experiment, I read these insurrections as iterations of the racial event. My proposition is that they expose how racial violence is the sine qua non for global capital. That is, it is the condition of possibility for capital accumulation under the hegemonic form of financial capital. My motive for this exercise is a recent move in contemporary European by contemporary European 
sorry, in, cont in contemporary European philosophers, recuperations of a communist project in the politics of the commons, in particular, a, co a project which reduced racial and cultural difference to a new liberal ideological tool. In this return to universalism, I find the same kind of thinking that justifies the episodes of total violence necessary for global capital to reproduce itself through the expropriation of the productive capacity of lands and labor of Europe's racial others. And here is my latest obsession. Take, for instance, Alain Badiou's recent comments on police brutality against black persons in the US and Islamophobia in France, both of which he reads as leftover overs of the colonial past. When commenting on police killings, he finds a similarity between these two countries. And I quote, there is a racist dimension in the action of the police in the US and in France, which a similarity that he resolves through a space-temporal distinction. He writes, I quote, in the United States, the problem goes back a longer time to slavery. It is a structural problem which is part of the entire history of the country since its beginning, end quote. And then he quickly resolves this by displays US racism to another time, and I quote again. On the one hand, we can interpret the police killing taking place under a president who is black as a as the expression of a fundamental racism against black people. On the other hand, it is not the case. Obama's, elections, uh, Obama's election points to a different reality, end quote. When considered in the light of Badiou's defense of universalism against cultural difference, it is evident that what he calls fundamental racism has to be categorically denied, restored to back then. This is so because his version of universalism, which sustains his communist thesis, is contingent upon the fidelity to the event, in this case, Obama's election, which, which signaled the end of racism in the US. I find that Badiou deploys time and space to establish a distinction which places racism over there, relevant in the US because of slavery, and back then, slavery is irrelevant after Obama's election. Operative in this distinction is a prevailing kind of temporal linear thinking that arose in Europe around the same time as capital, a kind of thinking that functions through the imposition of separation between what happens. That is, by reading the elements in any given situation as related sequentially. Temporal sequential thinking accounts for a, his, um, for a historical materialist disavow of the significance of the colonial juridic economic architectures, such as conquest, settlement, and slavery, of which the ratio is a reference, and also, of, I mean, of their relevance to capitalism. Time is not the appropriate dimension for observing the racial event, for it requires a release from the ontoepistemological constraints of modern thinking in which racial and its twin, cultural difference, is a mere reference of another time and another place. In this experiment, I deploy a materialist approach that tries to shift from the historical to the global register. By displacing temporal linear thinking, which imposes and necessitates the, the presumption of separability, I move to read back then and over, here, over there as constitutive of what happens right now. And the right there and uh, the right here, sorry, and what is yet to happen. This experiment with the practice form of materialist think reading, I, I call uh, compositional thinking or imaging. It heeds both Spiller's and Cook's statements that the marks of torture in the slave body transfer to later generations, Spiller's, and Liverpool's being, and then of, about Liverpool, being built with African blood. That was Cook's statement. My raw materialist perspective takes the elements of any episode of racial violence as prime matter, materia prima for thinking. It reads what happens as always 
a composition or decomposition or recomposition, always already a moment which is a singular assembling of that which also constitutes what has happened and what is yet to happen. Materiality here refers to, um, to matter at the quantum level, that which enters in the composition of everything that exists, always as matter energy. Thinking at this level of entanglement demands that we abandon or decenter time, Einstein's fourth dimension, conceived as the arrow of time, which accounts so much for the prevalence of sequential thinking. Borrowing from Benjamin, I describe the moment of occurrence which is distinguished from the site of occurrence, always already as a composition and necessarily, because composed of the same particles, necessarily similar to other possible composition, what has happened and is yet to happen. When attending to the similar, one necessarily looks for symmetry, that is, for correspondences. By attending to symmetry or looking for similarities, it is possible to image, recompose the context under observation as a fractal figure. That is, instead of looking for causal linear connection, compositional thinking seeks to identify pattern, a, pat a pattern that repeats at different scales. So how does it work? Let me begin by collecting the pieces. Um, The first one is from a 2011 BBC interview where the Liverpool police officer deployed to contain uh, the July 1981 revolts in Tartuffe. And the second one is from Captain Norris about, um, on board of the Liberty. So the police officer in the interview says, there was a hardcore of people who wanted to kill a police officer, he said. I just remembered three or four, or four times during that night thinking, this is it, I'm not getting out of here. A couple of older officers came up to me and said, that's Bobby King being killed. Somebody's had their leg chopped off. Somebody's being decapitated with a spade. It was frightening, a frightening situation before we even started. The sergeants tried to their best with the, the wrong man, but very soon it just became completely chaos, he said. The good thing now is no police officer will ever be put in the position where they can get injured so badly. It was a turning point where police tactics changed. Uh, so the second from Captain Norris, recording the attempted uprising on board of the units in 1790. The slaves attempt to force up the, great, the gratings in the night with a design to murder the whites or drown themselves, but were prevented by the watch. In the morning, they confessed their intention, and the women as well as the men were determined, if disappointed, of cutting the whites to jump overboard, but in case of being prevented okay, by their islands were resolved as their last resource to burn the ship. Their obstinacy put me under the necessity of shooting the ringleader. How to read episodes that happened 200 years apart? First, I need to select the similar pieces. Liverpool is the home of both Tata's neighborhood and the ship unity. Both episodes occurred in response to circumstances of total violence, enslaving and police killing. Both excerpts describe the situation as one in which the white persons involved, the ones responsible for total violence, are in a life-threatening situation. But, the black, but in both cases, the black person persons die. David Moore in Totteth and the ringleader in the Unity. Like every black insurrection registered during and after slavery, these insurrections responded to a circumstance of total violence perpetrated by those with immediate economic or juridic, but many times both, involvement in their oppressive situation. 
Reading for correspondences, I find that Captain Norris had an economic investment and the same juridical control, right to kill, over his cargo as Liverpool police had over the unemployed black youth in Toxteth. Looking closely at Norris's and the police officer's juridic, um, and the police juridic power, I find that in spite of the temporal uh, distance, 1770 and 1981, and why not 2011, and spatial distance, Atlantic Ocean and Liverpool, both have the same function. As captain and slave law holder, Norris functioned as a law enforcer, police for the slave trade on behalf of the merchants, while the police officers in Liverpool enforce the law for capital on behalf of Liverpool's shop owners. That is, both do something that is vital for capital from the outset. They are protecting property. In my reading, these temp spatial, spatial tempora temporally isolated episodes are entangled. They become iterations of the racial event, each exemplifying how racial violence protects property, the juridic economic relationship that joins the hip shared by state capital. Though capital has shape shifted over the past 500 years or so, the ethical force of property, that which authorizes total violence in both cases, has remained fundamentally the same. For global capital, financial capital deploys the juridic economic architectures that sustained merchant capital, the triangular trade which Liverpool led for decades, and industrial capital, the textile factories processed cotton planted and picked by the slaves transported by merchant ships like the Unity. These architectures assured the expropriation of the productive capacity of native colonized settled lands and slave labor and constitute the matter, the life and blood of global capital. The racial event is necessarily without time because of how racial difference refigures the colonial by comprehending the native and the slave as a scientific tool that writes their mental, moral, and intellectual traits outside of history, a big H here. Traditionally, critical racial thinking's responses through a social historical approach, their response to the effect of the racial has been to present racial matters in terms of the connections between back then and right now, or between over there and right here. It does not work. Knowing that Liverpool's merchants' profits from the slave trade enabled the emergence of modern banking in Britain and in the 17th century, does not, uh, in the 17th century does not expose how the racial links both these profits as well as black insurrections in today's Liverpool. That is, how the economic dispossession and policing animating them is part of the same assemblage that is global capital. For that to be thinkable, we need to be able to image what happens without time. Similarly, historical materialism fails to apprehend the racial because in the historical stage, property or means of production is figured in time, that is, as something that takes a different abstract form in time. Each successive form is contingent upon new social conditions that are separate from the preceding in time or, contemporary, or the contemporaneous space for in space. Precisely because separability and sequentiality ignore the symmetry highlighted above, historical materialists of today remain as ignorant of the workings of the racial as Marx was over a century ago. When poetical fractal thinking recalls this symmetry, it fractures it because it creates a composition, an image in Benjamin's sense, a complex pattern that disorders the linearity of progress as implied in Badiou's comments on Obama's election. It does so immediately, instantaneously, and in doing so, it exposes the global context as the actualization of each and every iteration of the racial event. Uh, to conclude, it reads, the fractal thinking reads the global as constituted by episodes of racial violence, and such, as such it comprehends, exposes how the colonial conquest, colonization, settlement, and slavery, 
how the, this juridic economic architecture now figures as global state capital.